the reader from the ministry of Jesus into the ministry of the apostles. Both Matthew and Mark offer an account of the commissioning by Jesus of the disciples to go into the world and preach the good news. And prior to this passage for us this morning, in Acts chapter 2, Jesus' disciples are equipped with the Holy Spirit and given divine power to share that gospel and also to heal. And we learn in this passage that that is exactly what they have been doing. The apostles have been sharing the good news of Christ and salvation to those in Jerusalem. However, just as Jesus' message did, the apostles' message of salvation was making the religious leaders a bit uncomfortable. The Sanhedrin were, were feeling threatened by their teaching. They were being made to look foolish among the people that they were there to lead. And back in chapter 4, verse 18, they were told to stop. Luke says, then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Having been instructed and in all actuality threatened to not speak or teach in Jesus' name, the apostles defy the order and they continue their teaching and preaching ministry. What our passage is about is the intentional defiance of the Sanhedrin's order by the apostles and their purposeful and intentional obedience of Christ's command. The Sanhedrin learned that they had paid no attention to their order. So they now call the apostles before the council again. And standing before the council, the high priest says to them, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of the man's blood. This verse describes the open defiance of the apostles, but it also describes something else. And that is the Sanhedrin were truly, truly feeling guilty. They were being convicted about what the apostles were teaching. You see, through the apostles' teaching of Christ's death and resurrection, they are accusing the Sanhedrin of putting an innocent man to death. And according to the Sanhedrin, the apostles are convincing the people of this through their teaching, enraging them against the Sanhedrin, and attempting to prove that they are guilty of Jesus' death. Whether it's true or not, according to the Sanhedrin, they want it stopped and stopped now. We don't want to hear anymore. The human condition that we can take from this passage is that we too not only feel guilt and conviction about our sinful actions, but we too want to prevent the truth from being known from being told. However, we must stand firm in our faith. For humanity desires to suppress 
the real truth from, from being known. So they can continue their behavior without any interruption or interference. Many want or expect society to conform to their ways. And if they don't, they react just as the religious leaders did in our passage. They will attempt to make others feel guilty for their righteous actions. Or they will attempt to eliminate all teaching or beliefs that is contradictory to theirs. Unfortunately, God's church has been caught in this trap. We have become a church that now obeys the ways of the world instead of the word of God. We have religious leaders in the world now conforming to the world so they don't anger or offend anyone. We even now go to the extreme of inter interpreting the scripture to justify our sinful behavior. Conforming to the law of the world as the Sanhedrin did in this passage. The world has a powerful, a great and lasting impact on humanity. Americans have become extremely committed to their careers and personal interests. So much so that they now never make time for God or church. In many cases, it's the, the drive for the almighty dollar. The dollar has become their God, and they now work seven days a week for it. Many in America work hard Monday through Saturday having Sundays off whereby they spend that day doing work around the house, never giving any time to God or the church. Many spend Sundays enjoying their self-interest in their hobbies, again, never giving God or church any of their time. The world also influences how we see and feel about ourselves. We live in a society where a large percentage of our population is never satisfied with who they are and how they look. Many are troubled by their identity and they are in a constant battle with trying to be who they are not. Many are dissatisfied with how they look and, and spend much time and money trying to achieve a look that the world says they should have. And as a result, our suicide rate has increased in adults and teenagers and even increased in among the preteens because they are so distraught about their identity and what they look like. What do we do about this? How do we correct this? The answer that Peter and the apostles gave to the Sanhedrin is the answer to humanity's plight as well. It's the good news that everyone in the world needs to hear and grasp hold. Peter and the apostles say in verse 29, we must obey God rather than human beings. The answer is that Jesus was raised from the dead by God and currently sits at the right hand of God. And it is through his death through his resurrection and his exaltation, that Jesus has become the Savior for the world and will forgive the world for its sins. A relationship with Jesus 
will help you to be happy with yourself. It will help you to find contentment. As believers and followers of Christ, we have been also empowered with the Holy Spirit just as the apostles were. And Jesus is the answer to our needs. And as a result, we have an obligation and responsibility to remain firm and grounded within God's Word. Why? So we can share the gospel message as Peter and the apostles were doing, regardless of what the world says, regardless of what the religious leaders of the world say. When our obedience to God and His Word is challenged, by the world and the world's religious leaders, we need to and must obey God and His Word. We must stand firm in our faith. I came across this short article that, that was giving advice about setting goals, and it was titled, Are You Willing to Die For? And it goes like this. I was sitting around wasting time when I had a thought. I needed to do, be doing something productive with my life. Sitting here watching Spongebob with my son is not getting the goals that I have set for myself done. So this, this waste of time is not going to change the lives of the people who I affect on a daily basis. So I got up and I, I reviewed my list of goals and I, I, that I set for the day. A few trivial goals jumped right off the page to me. And I started to reevaluate re -evaluate them all and what was important, important in my life. And I also looked at what a goal actually was. I decided my new goals needed to have a purpose that goes beyond emotional or personal feelings. They must have a deeper meaning and give me hope in times of despair, giving me renewed strength. And after revising my goals, I was left with one that I felt very strongly about. And this was a goal that I was ready and willing to die for. So I say to you, take some time to focus on your goals, not just on the tasks you want to accomplish, but review the reasons why. If you're not passionate about it, if it doesn't give you a feeling of purpose or hope, ask yourself this question. Are you willing to die for it? If you are not willing to die for it, then you will want to scratch it off your list. Now why did I tell you that story? You see, Peter and the apostles felt passionately, purposeful, and hopeful about the good news that they were preaching and teaching. And they were changing people's lives on a daily basis. You know that has to be true because that's why the Sanhedrin were called in before the council in the first place. They were looking too good And they were also willing to die for Christ and His Word. We, my friends, we are to do the same. We are to be ready and willing to do the same. If you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit has entered your body and lives within you. 
And you have been called, you have been commissioned to share the good news to your neighbors. Not just your preacher. If we teach and preach to our neighbors as the apostles did, People's lives around us will be changed. And you have to remember you will make enemies. And we too must be prepared to die for Christ and His Word also. God forbid that a time ever come. If we do as the apostles did, People will begin to come to church. But more importantly, it's not about getting people into our church. It's not about getting more money. It's about changing lives. It's about getting souls to heaven into eternity. It's about people learning to love themselves. To accept themselves, to find contentment, to find meaning in their lives. That's what it's about. And we need to reach out to them. We must stand firm in our witness and our testimony of Christ and His Word through every, through every circumstance we are facing. Pray. God of mercy and grace, you have given the world the greatest gift ever by sending your son to die and resurrecting him on that third day. It is through this action and your grace that we receive the salvation that you provided by this gospel. Father, we pray for you to give us courage and strength, as you did the apostles, to teach and preach this good news to our neighbors. And help us, help us to remain true to your word and share the gospel message under all circumstances, even, even if it results in imprisonment or death. Father, we pray this in your Son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, number 514 in your hymn. 514.
leave here this morning and go into our communities. Let us go as soldiers of the cross. Let us go in strength, in trust. And let us go in obedience to your word. And let us preach and teach the good news of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, I don't even know how to turn it on.